kill me. Just hold your horses, buddy. All right, we're good. <laughs> Actually, I'm just going to kill this whole thing. And like I said, I didn't prepare anything. So we're just talking because I've been working on this for a few weeks and um, it's fun and I think it's really fascinating even though it's extremely dorky. So the title this week was, what did I call it? Was it Commodity Market yeah. Trading with Ruby? Commodity Market Trading with Ruby. So that's an extremely misleading title because this is really about Eve Online. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so I, I, pl I, play this, I play this space game uh, called EVE Online, and it's a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. And what's different about EVE Online than other MMOs is it has a fully functional um, player-driven market. That There's about 20,000 items on the market, and all of them are... Well, almost all of them. I would say of that 20,000, probably 19,000 of them are all either manufactured, well, they are, they're manufactured or found by players. So it's a huge, and I, yes, I play a woman online. <laughs> it's, there's a huge percentage of the market that is driven by player activity. And so the life cycle of the market is that you have these asteroids that you go out in a spaceship and you mine these asteroids and it produces raw ore. And this raw ore you can sell on the market to other people who buy it at whatever the market price is based on demand. Um, wow, you just can't even see that at all. Um, all right, that's, that's not bad. That's not bad. So you have these asteroids, and you go out to these asteroids in your spaceship, and you point your mining lasers at these asteroids, and you generate raw ore, which you can then turn around and sell on the market. And people buy this ore and do things with it. Or what do you do with this ore? You take this ore, and you refine it into raw minerals. And you can sell those minerals on the market. And people can buy those minerals or sell them or buy them or whatever. Those minerals are then used to compose into items, which then are used by players to modify their spaceships. And um, you, they, you can uh, use some items to construct into other items, so like they're like larger items, or you can sell those items directly uh, that are being used. Um, you have a ship that you fly, and people have lots of different ships, and each ships have certain uh, slots on them. I'll, if you can see this, I'll bring up the fitting window even though I'm in a really dorky ship right now. But what you can see is it has two fittings on it right here. Uh, and then there are some empty slots that are hard to see over here and some empty slots down here. And you fit things on your ship based on what your purpose is. Uh, and what happens is you fly your ship out in space and someone will blow you up. And so when that happens, you buy a new one. And you buy a new ship, and you buy new items, and then it, it's just this endless cycle of buying things and blowing things up. Yes? Isn't there also a way to convert real money into in-game? All right, so yes. So all of these things are on the market. So you have this ore, you have minerals, you have raw components, you have uh, manufactured components and then you have macro components as well uh, and all of these things are traded on the market and the only way to get ships on the market is for another player to manufacture a ship. If the player doesn't manufacture a ship you can't fly it because one doesn't exist. So everything on the market is player driven and the demand for ships is based upon what ships are cool. And so the, there is a real supply and demand market going on. And the price for ships fluctuate over time. And the price for modules fluctuates over time based on what the trends are in the game for what ships you want to fly. So what we have is, an, is, is close to what you can get with a real functioning economy in a virtual world. 
Now, how does that get funded? Well, the game, the manufacturer, CCP, uh, they sell what's called PLEX, which is a pilot license extension certificate or something like that. And what that represents is that represents one month of playtime. That PLEX is tradable on the market. And so you can buy that PLEX for, let's call it $19.99, and turn around and sell it in-game for in-game money. And then someone who happens to have, here, and I'll pull this up, what I have over here is this is the market browser and this is my wallet um, over here. And so if you look at like here's the journal of all the, uh, let me, yeah, this is the journal of all the transactions and you can see some of them are green and some of them are red for based on when I buy things and when I sell things. This is the market browser. Uh, and so here is, for instance, the market data for Plex. And this is really hard to see. But what I want you to see here is this is the location of this column right here is the location of where the resource exists. And all of these exist in this current station except for this right here. So if you're familiar with market trading, there's something called the book. And the book is made up of two things. People have something and they want to sell it and people want things. And they say, I'm willing to buy this thing for this price, and that's a bid. This party over here says, I have this thing, and I'm willing to sell it, and that's an ask. And so I have three of these, and I'm willing to sell them for this price. You can pay that price. And this book is typically ordered where the sell orders have the minimum sell, the minimum ask at the top and the maximum buy at the top. So there's a, mar there's a spread between those two things. So right here what you see, this is the book. This top order right here is this guy has 20 plex that he's willing to sell for 519,400,000 ISK, that's the in-game currency, per plex. Here's the buy portion of the book down here. This guy's willing to buy 13 plex for 509. So what's the spread? The spread's about 10 million isk. So if this spread was, if, if for instance they were the same, if the top of the buy book and the top of the sell book were the same, then the transaction would just take place, right? They, the two are equal. So there's what you, what you have here in market trading on this particular item is you have people that are allowing the, the, the market to flow, that they're adding a certain amount of ease to the market, that if you're willing to go ahead and you've got a Plex and you just want to sell it and you need the money right away, you sell it for 509. If you have a Plex and, you're not, and you don't need the money right away, you can list and ask and maybe you'll get this price, odds are you probably will, but you don't know when. You don't know when they're gonna when someone will come along. Someone might come along and say, "Oh, my account expires today. I really need to buy a Plex, so I'm gonna just buy it for whatever the top of the sell book is. I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna pay the 519. I'll apply it to my account, and we move on. So there's a spread there, and this exists for every item in the game. Every item in the game, like this right here, is uh, an Amar fuel block, and you can't see this. Um, I'm only looking specifically at uh, asks that are in the station. Um, but this Amar fuel block is 12,520 is the top of the sell book. The top of the, of the buy book or the, or the bid price is 12,155. So the spread there is like only 400. So the question is, if you are so my character is what's called a station trader. I never undock. I don't fly my ship in space because I don't want it to be blown up. All I do is I sit here and I look at the market and I decide what items have enough spread and have enough velocity. So in addition to the book, Eve will give you, and it's kind of hard to see here. Yeah, it's really hard to see. It gives you a history of the transaction. This is over the last month. You can see the green line here in the middle is the 30-day moving average. 
and there is a red line which you can't see which kind of bounces up and down more volatilely which is the five day moving average and each of these dots represents the daily average and then you can't see it at all but it has these little lines going up and down which shows the daily maximum sell price and the daily minimum sell price so this is historical data of what was actually traded that day and you can also get this data in game using a table and what this table shows is on this day there were 126 orders and a total of 13,005 or, or 1,350 items and the low price was 10,100 and the high price was 17,500 and the average price was 12,375 so as a station trader I make all of my money by buying low and selling high the question is when you have and I'll show you this the, the I don't know if you would be able to see it or not um, you can search here you have all of these items and actually I can show you this in get in my little tool that I've been building so CCP is really awesome they make all of this data externally available and so they have what's called the static dump and the static dump is a database dump of all of the things in the game that are not dynamic meaning prices are dynamic what's being sold is not why is that not pulling up I bet I broke this ember never breaks all right this is why you never live code Devil, nothing market to all. App, views, categories, index. And this is all Ember because, as we know, Ember's awesome. And it's me trying to figure out how Ember works. Which is not very well. What thing? Require mass utility. Does it? Mm. Comments have to be contiguous. I think you want one more. Two more. Required tree. You got to require tree in jQuery. Require subs. Doesn't the app have to exist before all my Ember classes? You're doing require self there. Oh, sure. And it won't require. It won't respect <coughs> requires that aren't at the very top of your file. Meaning, if there's a line of code, it won't respect that comment below it. All right. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so it still didn't load up. Oh, yeah, that it actually did all that stuff. Um <laughs> it was doing table sorter add parser and you said I don't need There we go. Look at there. So this is actually the um, this is actually the item tree of things that are buyable. And so you have these categories, and these are market groups, and each market group has a, a children of market groups, and they have a parent. And like so, these are all the different types of ammunition, and there's different sizes. These are all the individual things. Uh, and I don't have this yet linked up in Ember to actually show you details. But I did want to just show you this tree because this tree represents like how many things exist out here that can be traded. And they're actually, all these things are used like here's like actually all the ships. And so you've got different classes of ships like let's say cruisers and you've got standard cruisers and then you have this race of cruisers or you have advanced cruisers which have like all these different categories heavy assault ships and then there's this race worth of 
uh, heavy assault ships. So there's a lot of items here. And as a trader, that works against you because you're wondering, hey, what do I want to trade that's going to make me money? It's an excellent question, and that's what I've been working on. <laughs> so let me, uh, I told you that Eve makes the static data available, and this is the static data. This is what I'm showing you. And there's more details that are associated with this. Let me pull up um, in Emacs. <laughs> I'll show you the database schema that they give you. And so you have all these tables. How many tables are there? There's tons and tons and tons of tables. So you have like these combat zones, which are based on the faction warfare stuff. Um, translations, because it's in like five or six different languages that are available. Um, here are all of a table that represents all of the stations in the game. The stations are relatively static. Uh, it's actually true that players can buy their own stations and put them up, in which case they're added to this table. And the next time that there's a release and CCP dumps the data, it will show up in this data of static table. Uh, and so you see things like here's their X, Y, Z coordinates in space. That's pretty awesome. Um, you have station types because there's a bunch of different types of stations. There's different things you can do in stations based upon how they are defined or what they're doing. Um, you have, what are some other things that are here? This is the map of the universe uh, as a table. I haven't even looked in what's in that. That might be kind of interesting. Here are a map of all the solar systems. Um, in the universe, I think that there's like, what, is there 6,000? No, there's more than 6,000. There might be like 20,000 solar systems in the universe. Uh, and it's a pretty big place. And so each solar system has connections between them. And there's regions. And this is all, um, this is all fairly interesting. Here, I'll give you an example of a region. Um, <laughs> um, so, can you get the historical sales data or just the static? Yeah, so I'm getting to that in just a minute. So, these are all of the regions in the game, and this particular website, evemaps.land, is the definitive out of game mapping tool. They use the static dump to build this tool. And so everything that you see in here, like here's the forge, for instance. This is one region, and each of these represents a solar system. And in the solar system, there's a number of planets. What you're looking at right here is not NPC kills. Let's look at jumps. And so this is showing you that this system right here had 83 jumps by a player into or out of it. Uh, this right here is Jita. It's in bright red. Jita is the undisputed trade hub of the universe. And they periodically have to shut the server down because it gets overloaded. Or they lock people out so you can't jump into it because they have a maximum number of users. This is all one universe. All players are, are working in the same market at the same time. This is not like World of Warcraft where you have like an East server and a West server. It's one giant universe. And each of these systems are typically hosted on, like you might have one of their nodes in their cluster, which might have a region or it might have four or five systems. Jita gets its own server. And it has, like right now, where, let me pull up the local chat. It has 1,814 people in Jita at this very moment. And most of those people are either buying and selling or scamming other people. <laughs> The Eve sandbox is really crazy in what it allows. So anyway, this is an idea of the static data. The question is dynamic data. No, they don't provide, and they have an API for things that you can query. You can query through the API what your personal market transactions are. So I can see what I've sold and what I've bought. I can see what orders I have outstanding because that's all through the API. But to query Eve and say, what is the current market data for this item? They don't expose that. How about the uh, stuff you were showing in the charts before, like historical market data? 
No, they do not. Anything that exists over here in this market browsing tool is not exposed via an API. But every time you do a market query, the client caches this into a local cache. <laughs> and there is a Python library that knows how to parse that cache and pull all of this data out. And there was questions for a long time about whether this was legal with the EULA or not. And CCP has come out and said, yes, you can scrape the cache. So there's this other website, um, which is uh, Eve Central. Eve Central was the first place that started scraping market data. And it was collecting market data from as many places it could. Originally, you had to manually upload market data. Hey, what's the current price for this? And a user would sit down and type it in. Eventually, they got where they could scrape caches. And they had this custom client that runs only on Windows that would scrape your client and upload directly to their website what the market data was as you were making market queries. A lot of people was interested in that data. And Eve Central couldn't keep up. So they created what is called the EMDR, Eve Market Data Relay. And so they're using 0MQ, that they have a network of, and I forget how many there are, there's like, I want to say, eight or nine data sources. No. <clears throat> connecting to the network. So this use, if you're familiar what 0MQ is, I don't, I don't know if you are or aren't. Um, where is getting access to the EMDR network? There's the list of the servers. There's a handful of servers that are located all over. And 0MQ e, uh, is a messaging system much like, uh, say, AMQP or Redis or whatever these, it's a queuing system. And if you're familiar with socket programming, you as a, as a client, you connect to a server and you read from that. And that's a, a, a client-server relationship that the two of you are having a direct connection and you talk to each other. ZeroMQ is not like that at all. ZeroMQ has this mesh of servers and you say, I'm going to open a ZeroMQ uh, connection socket and it acts like a socket but you can subscribe to as many servers as you want to through the same socket. And when you say read, it reads a message off of whichever one of those servers happens to have a message next. So what I have is a very simple client. What are you reading? So let me, yeah, okay. That, there are, is this unified, um, where was that link? It's the data format right there. Yes. There is this unified data uh, uploader data unified uploader data interchange format. And you see up here off of the domain, this is coming from Eve Central. And what they have done is defined a JSON structure that says when I do a market query, I can format it like this to capture all the data that was in that market window in a way that everybody can understand. And it's a, it's a plain JSON structure. So you can see here is a order result. And then down here, there's a history result. And so when you query the market history, it generates a message like this, and it gets uploaded to Eve Central or really into the network of, of EMDR servers. That's a zero MQ. So I have a, I have a client that's running locally. Um, it's written in Python. It scrapes the cache file. Every time I do a, a market query, it scrapes the cache file. It formats what it finds into this format and then writes it to zero MQ, which is basically just handing it off to the cloud and the servers take it from there. Now I have a client program that also sits there and connects to the cloud and says, give me the fire hose. And I get, when I'm connected to it, um, I don't know. Let's, let's see. So they're essentially crowdsourcing the live data. By yes. Everybody that will, is willing to run this client to keep uploading. Yes, and the sneaky thing is, is that 
the, the game, part of the game is based on skills, right? So you train these skills and these skills allow you to fly your ship better or do or manufacture better or mine better or whatever better. There's lots and lots of skills, hundreds of skills. I think they added it up. If you trained all the skills, the skills train in real time. So you have a cue that says, I want to train these skills. And they say, okay, this skill will take you 30 minutes. This skill will take you two days and this skill will take you a month. If you added up the, the complete time it would take to train every skill in the game, it's something like 10 years. So it's a really long, it's a lot of skills. So there's the whole part of the game is making decisions about which skills to train when. And there's this out of game tool called Evemon, which uses the API to query what's my skill training queue look like right now. And it tells you whether it's empty or not. And then you can plan out what you want to go in the skill queue. Well, Evemon supports this. And so it has built into it a cache scraper. So if you're running Evemon, the default is for all of your market queries to get uploaded. And Evemon is like the definitive skill planner and some, some huge percentage of players use Evemon and they probably don't even know that they're uploading market data. So let me give you a little, sh uh, show you what I have here in uh, app. Uh, models client. This is my 0MQ client. Um, this is in a Rails app and he has an initializer that loads up 0MQ. Um, what you can see here is this class is a client. Um, he has a subscriber and a context. Here's the list of those relay servers. When he gets initialized, he creates a new 0MQ context. He subscribes to everything and he sets his socket options to be give me everything. And then he has this message in here where he does a receive message. He takes that data and he converts it into, I'm storing this in MongoDB. And so he news that up and saves it. And so the receive message, we take the string and this is the 0MQ interface that you have to give it like a reference here and you receive the message into that reference, which then gets uh, decompressed and then parsed as JSON. And then that gets shoved in as the attributes to new on this guy. Uh, and then it gets saved. And so I have this process right here, which, um, which does the read and then sleeps. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back up that sleep and then I'm going to, well, let me show you that document. Um, so this message has, this is just like the JSON structure. Um, he has his result type. He has this upload keys is kind of a unique identifier. And so one of the things that I've done is do something like uh, puts received message from message. I've already forgotten it upload keys dot inspect all right done so then we come over here to the terminal this is my python uploader that's uploading market queries and this guy right here cd, CD devil market tool and i'm going to run foreman start and we should see a lot of chatter as soon as Rails boots up, <laughs> I think. <coughs> there we go. That's being buffered. Foreman is buffering that output. So there you go. That's live messages coming in as people are making market queries. It's coming in over 0MQ, a very small amount of code to receive a lot of messages from a lot of different servers. So this guy's doing this. The other thing that I wanted to show you to give you an idea of how much data is going on is... So you're not querying. I'm not querying. You're I'm just, just passively listening. Yeah. I'm call <coughs> what I'm doing is I call receive. And if it has something, it gives it to me. If it doesn't, it blocks. But it doesn't block for very long. Seems like that could fill up your hard drive pretty quick. 
<laughs> it turns. It actually turns out it, it can. And if you leave this running overnight, you'll probably come in in the morning and your machine won't work anymore. <laughs> Just guessing. So, so, I mean, is this, are you doing anything like special here to do this asynchronously, or I mean, it, does ZeroMQ handle that for you? ZeroMQ does handle that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So does it? I mean, I guess it's I not know. asynchronous, right? What ZeroMQ does is ZeroMQ manages all of those socket, because under the covers, there's probably socket connections to all of those relays that I'm connected to, right? right. And what ZeroMQ is buying me is with a single receive call, I can be waiting for things on all of those sockets, and when something comes up, it comes to me. And I don't have to manage that connection pool. I don't have to manage any of that kind of stuff. I, I guess part of what I'm asking is, Will this get ever get backed up in the fact that like you can't process the messages fast enough? That's a really interesting question. I know the answer to it yet. Okay. I don't know if there are more messages coming through than what I can handle, or if my machine is a is actually able to keep up with the flow. I think zero MQ doesn't store anything, so I think if you didn't ask for it, it would disappear. That's probably true. I think probably when I make the the, the call. To receive message, it says it just gives me whatever's there at the time, yeah. and if I've missed something in that window, then I've missed it. I think you have to be already asking for it when it comes in, or else you won't get it. No, no, I understand. But so this is interesting. I don't know if you can second. see this or not. Five thousand a second. What happens to the Yeah. You can barely see this on this computer. What you what you can see is. This is, each dot represents one of those solar systems in the whole universe. And they all have XY coordinates, right? And so there's a well-known representation of these, of the, of the universe. And what they're doing is, you can see at the top, there's the number of active EMDR upload clients. And this represents each system that is getting a market query during this tick. It lights up the map. And what you can't see is you can't see, there's some of those that are, it's showing you green, the green ones because the green ones are the ones that are actually being policed by police. And there's some yellow ones that are not, they're kind of policed, and there are red ones that are not policed at all. And so you can't see on the, because of the contrast, the ones that are red and yellow that, are, that, that these market queries are coming in. So this is really an interesting example and look, you can see that this number is growing based upon this is the number of, of unique ones that the, that the client is connecting. And I, I don't know exactly how they implemented this. Um, I don't know if this is running in JavaScript or what this is doing. But there's a lot of data coming across this, this network. It's really interesting. So once you figure out how to actually do this and like make trading decisions based on this data, this seems brutally open to market manipulation. Yes. You can yes. just publish random prices of things. They yes. Call, you can do that now. And yes. They call that market PVP. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to Eve. <laughs> That's the way the game is designed. <laughs> and so there is definitely ways, because you're connecting to multiple relay servers, and really there's, you know, I showed you here on the map. Uh, let me go back. There's this many regions, right? And the prices are per region. So when you do a market query, you're only getting the prices in this one region. So if there are five people in the outer ring who do a market query for the same item within a fairly short period of time, all five of those people should have the exact same result set. And if they don't, you know. So when you're connected to the, to the, to the EMDR, it's wise to do some validation on the data that you're getting in because it is absolutely open to market manipulation. It doesn't even have to be market queries, right? I could just be posting to their servers whatever JSON I want to. Could you spin up an army of servers that are posting fake data to make it look like it's all Now, you can, that's part of what I was showing you with, um, with this guy right here, right? Each of these things are showing a, a unique upload key. And if it becomes apparent that you have this army of bots, then you can be blacklisted, right? They're, the tools are here to do this kind of uh, defensive maneuvers as well as offensive maneuvers. Blacklisted by the game or by players like you? By players like me. The game doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> you, you refer to policing. What is that? 
So in the game, there are NPC ships called Concord that are the police. And there are actions that are punishable by police, and it is swift and brutal. However, it is also possible that it's, you know, in, in, in uh, any combat situation, you have a sustained damage per second that you can, uh, that you can uh, exert. And then you have what's called the alpha strike. So if you engage in criminal behavior in police space, Concord shows up in a matter of seconds and destroys your ship. You just, there's, no way, there's no way to get around it. And any way you figure out how to get around it is considered an exploit and your account is banned. So you're going to get destroyed if you engage in PVP with another ship in this high security space. However, if you have enough alpha strike, meaning that your first volley of weapon fire is enough to destroy the ship, then you can destroy their ship and Concord will show up and destroy you like they dutifully do. And then your buddy comes along with his transport ship and scoops up all the juicy loot. <laughs> completely legitimate. <laughs> now, if your ship that you're flying around in high sex space is really big and tough, it may take a couple ships of Alpha Strike coordinated to destroy your ship. And so you might see a fleet of like maybe 10 of these ships that are cheap, maybe they only cost a couple mil, and so all total, maybe they have 25 mil, maybe they have 30 mil invested. They exert an alpha strike, they destroy your ship. All of them get destroyed, but your ship is worth hundreds of millions and theirs is worth two million apiece. They call that a win. Because they have other ships that come along. Because they have other ships that comes along and scoops everything up. EVE is an open sandbox. And this kind of, this kind of brutal head-to-head -head PVP is encouraged. <laughs> but that's not what you're dealing in. With this character. Yes. And if you were to <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so, I mean, you can actually then get um, uh, market data from different uh, regions or different places as well and be, do straight up like arbitrage trading between yes. areas and all that kind of stuff. You, you totally could, so except you the physical, you have to move right. things. Yeah. And that incurs its own risk, obviously. Sure. So, the easiest thing to do is I do, I have this character that's set up purely to make money and it sits in station and I buy and sell things. And once a day, usually some days I'll do it twice, some days I'll skip, um, I'll go in and I'll update all my orders. And so you see right here, what I have is, this is the list of my orders. I have all of these things over here that I'm selling. This is my inventory that I'm selling. And these are the things that I'm buying. And so when I come out here and I look at this small capacitor booster, here's my order in blue. And you can see I'm down low. And so what I do is I come in here and I'll modify this order and I'll bump it up a few cents. So here's mine that's uh, 1, 1, 0, 6, 1, uh, and 90 cents. And the one above it is only up by maybe a thousand. So it's not much. There's a really tight margin between all these book values. And so that's part of what this PVP is, is this constant one, one isking up and down to try and jockey so that you're at the top position. So I'll come in here and I'll add, um, I'll add a little bit on here, like I'll add another hundred. And when I update that, um, he refreshes and there I am, I'm at the top. Now the next person who comes and sells a small capacity, capacitor booster two, and they're willing to do it without setting up an ask, uh, they'll just hit my bid and I'll get that item and it'll show up in my inventory and then I can turn around and come over here and sell it. And that's what a lot of people so these are essentially just like, I mean, I'm, these are limit trades, right? Where you're setting up your limit and, but you can just do a market trade if you just want to buy it immediately for whatever yeah. the market price is. Yeah. And that's what like 75% of people do yes. because people don't want to wait. Because right. people don't want to wait. Right. So, what else is interesting about this and how can I actually claim to talk about market trading or commodities market trading? So one of the things that I did is um, I have this, um, these are my mongoid documents which represent, um, which represent, I've lost it now. Unified uploader. 
topic does not exist. How about that? Which represents this JSON structure fairly well. And what I have is these are market rows or order rows, and these are history rows. And so what I did is I created um, an object which I call a type price. And the type price is, has uh, a thing that it's priced for. It has a minimum sell, a maximum buy, and the average quantity per day. And what this tells me is it allows me to calculate if you look at, um, so I'm using basic manufacturing formulas here that my cost per each transaction is the maximum buy price in, including my transaction tax rate. So every time I do a trade, I have to pay a certain amount of tax, which is two and a quarter percent. It's just like the real world. It's just like the real world. Eve is real. So <laughs> my cost is the, buy, the maximum buy price times my tax rate, and then my, my revenue is just whatever the minimum sell is. So the spread, which is the profit, is the revenue minus cost, and the markup is the profit divided by the cost. And I calculated the, what I'm calling the velocity, and I don't know if this is, I'm sure this is a real thing, I don't know what the name of it is. The velocity is basically, what is the potential realizable profit based upon how many items are moving in a day and what's the spread? So if I was able to do 100% of the buys and 100% of the sells, what would my profit be that day? Mm, All right. So, like sizing the market, right? That's right. I'm trying to figure out which items, because some items have a, a nice spread, but they're only going to make me like 1,000 a day, right? I don't care about those. I want the ones that are millions <laughs> per day. This is straight up, I mean, this is straight up stock trading. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to like, that's like, what you're trying to calculate oftentimes, I think, are what are called alphas and betas and things like that, yeah. which go, yep. go to like volatility and things. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The only problem is that there's no stock trading software designed for Eve yet. <laughs> I mean, but like the, the stuff that like you get on E-Trade or whatever, That's I mean, not true. they're like showing like yeah. candle charts and stuff like that, which is what those original yeah. charts were and yeah. daily volumes and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, so let me show you. This is the other stuff that I have because this is the point at which I decided. So this is the point at which I decided to, quote, give up and use Rails. And so I've, the Ember app, I'm just killing the instantiation of the Ember app, and I'm showing you the page that, um, the page that is like actual, my thing that actually works. So what I've done is I did some map reducing this weekend, which was the final piece that turned this into something that is like honest to goodness valuable to me. And I have all these things in Mongoid which has all these order rows which are keyed off of the type. And what I want to do is figure out what's the minimum buy and the maximum sell. Minimum sell, maximum buy. And so I did that. And that's what this type is here um, in this type price. You can see he has a method down here that says update prices. And so this history row update prices sets the average quantity on this object and the order row update prices sets the minimum sell and maximum buy. And that was done with MapReduce, which was kind of cool because I never understood MapReduce. Let's look at the history one because it's really straightforward. Um, in Mongoid, which is a Ruby library which wraps around the Mongo database, it provides the call to Mongo, which is a document storage, it's MapReduce function, and that's in JavaScript. So what I have here in Ruby, and this is a little bit mind-bendy, I have a Ruby string, <laughs> which is a JavaScript function for mapping. And what this is doing is the, the concept of mapping and reducing says, I want to take my data set and extract out the pieces that I need and put it in a well-known format, and then reduce. So what this is, this emit function, says here's my key type id and here's the thing that i care about which is the quantity the daily the daily order quantity and so i'm generating a list of types in their daily order quantity and i don't care about what day it was on all right because that's what i'm throwing away out of the stuff then the reduce function takes the key in an array of the values 
and does something with it. And in this case, it sums them up and divides by the length and it averages whatever those values are. Now what's interesting is that this reduce function can be called in parallel. You have this set that maybe your, maybe your types, there's like, what I have is like, uh, let's say it's about 6,000 items, or which is what I've collected messages from, from people who are querying the market. I have about 6,000 unique items, and of those 6,000 unique items, I have millions of history row data. So let me show you that, actually. Technically, they can both be called in parallel, because mapping is just a... Yeah. True. You know, so this is roughly what my current data set looks like whenever it comes up. Instantiate. Wait, what? Oh, I have to put that out. <laughs> this is why you never live code. So I've received 137,000 messages. And of those messages, there are row sets per message. And I've got 23,000 row sets. I have 6,000 unique items in my database. And in GTA 4.4, which is the central trade hub, I have 95,000 market orders of, buy, of, of bids and asks. Is that while we were talking? Or? No, this is over the past few days. But I can generate this. I can get to this point in probably maybe two or three hours because the same items are, are cycling. And it's 24 hours, right? The people in, you know, in Europe and in Russia and in uh, even China, although they have their own server actually, and in the United States, it's all around the clock that this market is continuous. There's no open and close values, right? That's one of the things that's different about the Eve market versus the stock market. So then I have here almost 2 million history rows of data. And I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna group it into rows of their types, which are these 6,000, and then all of the daily quantities. And when we go to reduce that, it's going to segment that however it wants to. Like you're saying, the map could be happening in parallel, the reduce could be happening in parallel. That it's going, the, the important thing is that the map function needs to emit exactly what the reduce function does, because the output of the reduce function can go back into the reduce function. Because if he, if he chunks the stuff that has to be reduced and he runs like 10 reduces, he's going to take the output of those 10, make it one more call to reduce query, which then does it again. So it has a uniform data structure from the, the map outputs a uniform data structure and reduce processes that and generates the exact same data structure with more significant data. Now the interesting thing is when I run this you know, this is my data size. When I run my update prices, even with this data size, I can run the whole thing. Order prices to get the minimum sell and to get the maximum buy and to get the average quantity. I can run that whole thing in less than a minute. And I tried to do it in SQL first and I just, it, I couldn't get it to complete. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have enough memory for it. I didn't, I, whatever, it was just sat there. What's that? Multiple threads or processes? Um, no. Yeah, this is all. This is a single thread in Mongo, and Mongo handles whatever it, however it does. And that's just a single instance of Mongo as well. That's true. Because one of the things that Mongo is really strong at with these yeah. MapReduce functions is when you've got sharded instances, right? It'll actually run those each individually on each instance. Yeah. Right, and so you can like sort of get subsets, and then it'll automatically combine. Them. So this is the end of the day. What I've done here is I filtered out 632 items that have both buy and sell orders, some items don't have both, that have a markup of more than 15%. Wow. And so these are, uh, this is the jQuery table sort thing. You can sort by this. See, there's, this is the bottom 15%. This is actually a ship. An heiress is a ship, um, and it has a 15% markup. Some of these items have crazy markup. So this guy right here, and this is this is market PVP, right? There's almost no buy orders because this guy's trying to buy it for three dollars and forty cents essentially, but the lowest sell order is almost thirty-four hundred. So what that's saying is that there's a huge market disparity there, and what what you could totally do but is come in. Right? There's a little bit. What this isn't showing is 
are these buy orders or sell orders? And so what I suspect is that these are all sell orders and that none of the buy orders are getting fulfilled. And that shows in the game. So let's go actually, actually, let me. Worth mentioning, there's an in-game browser. So yeah, let me open that up. That's what I was just getting ready to do. In the game, there is a um, accessory, and it's its own browser, and it's really terrible. Just but. And so you can load up this, and they actually have published JavaScript APIs to interact with the market. So let's take this, let's, where was that, the markup? So here's this guy right here. This little I button, I have linked to what's the show info function. So here's the, in the browser, I executed JavaScript that executed on the client. And it says this Type T Power Core Modification Diagnostic System monitors and optimizes the power grid, gives a slight boost to power core output and a minor increase in shield and capacitor recharge rate. All that stuff means probably nothing to very many of you at all. But it has all these attributes. It's a thing. It's a static data thing. So that's the show info that I popped up from JavaScript. Now I can click on the link here and now that executes a JavaScript function which queries the market. And now I can see here's the book for this item. And you can see there's tons of sell orders. And there's just a few asks. Here's this 340. That makes me think that these right here are fairly recent. Um, so if you look at the price history, you can see that there is some have, been, have gone at this 350. <laughs> And the high was 20,000. The average was 2,000, which doesn't tell me very much. That makes me think that somebody's really manipulating the Monarca, that they probably have a large quantity of these things that they're dumping at some price in order to try and adjust it. But uh, add standard deviation to your. I don't get standard deviation. I can't calculate these values. All I can get is the average, which is unfortunate. I'd love to get standard deviation. You get it over time if you collect the current data over time. If I got, if I was certain, I got all the data. Yeah. Well, it would be, a, it would be an estimate of the So as long as you have a good sample, right? But what this is showing, what this is showing is that the previous days look a little bit more realistic. That the high is for, that from yesterday, the high is forty two hundred, the low is forty two hundred, and the average was forty two hundred. The day before that, it was forty four hundred, and the day actually looks like he's manipulating this a long time. <laughs> that's that's almost two weeks worth so of solid market manipulation. The problem is, is you can't see who that is. The only way to know who it has the buy order and who has the sell order is to complete it. Really? So you don't know who you're buying from and who wow. you're selling to. It's completely anonymous until after the trade takes place. So you could feel it out with a bot if you needed to. If I was you willing buy to. Something every day and see if it's always the same guy. Yeah. I mean, there's whatever strategies, right? There's, there's, the, the, it's re I mean, this is fascinating stuff. I don't care what you think about blowing spaceships up in space. This is fascinating, the amount of data that's here and the tools that you can have to play with in a way that doesn't, like, cost you your life savings. It's, it's, it's worth noting that there are economists, like Ivy League economists, that study EVE. CCP has three on staff. Yeah. Really? So, yes. And everything that they do in game design has to go through the economists. And they're doing big because they're afraid analysis. that they're going to... The economy is critical to the game. If the economy yeah. crashed, the game would be over, and then they would stop getting money. Has and there been, like, crashes? <coughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, like, market crashes. I mean, yes. Has there not been quantitative easing? Like, There's no regulation, so it's like, yes, pre-depression easing. Because they control... The only thing that's controlled, an item that's controlled by CCP is Plex. And they set the real dollar value. The other the thing that they do is if you kill NPC rats, <laughs> if, if they kill NPC, they don't control prices on Plex. The actual dollar price, they do. They, they control the actual dollar price. Right. So uh, not the in -game. But not the in game price. No. But they do, when you kill an NPC pirate or an outlaw, they have these, these NPC outlaws, when you kill them, Concord gives you a reward, and that's what they control. That's an ISK faucet. And so they control the rewards that are given from killing so these NPC they, uh, pirates, is what cool. we call them. The other thing that they control is um, mission rewards. 
So you can go on like quests that you might think about from other games and they give you reward for that. Uh, so they control that, which is another ISK faucet. And then they control things like, um, well, when they rebalance ships. Here's a ship that performs like this, and everybody's used to how this performs, and it has a certain amount of popularity based on how people like to fly it. And it sells for X amount based on that demand. Then they come through and says, oh, he gets an extra high slot. Well, now this ship's going to become more popular, and that affects supply and demand. The other thing that they did was they had for a while these NPC, they call them drones, they were rogue drones, uh, that you would go out and shoot these rogue drones. And instead of getting bounty rewards for killing them, they actually had minerals because they were made of alloys. And so they you would destroy them and you'd get these metal alloys, which would refine into minerals, which were used to manufacture stuff. They took that out. And so now this vast source of minerals is gone. And so the mineral market bottoms out. There's no more minerals on the market. And the prices skyrocket. The other thing that they did was they changed the ships that, that players fly to mine. They changed the defensive characteristics of those. And a certain large group of people decided it would be fun to blow them all up, even though they would get concorded afterwards, which affected the supply of minerals, which caused the prices to go up. So anyway, that's all I have. This is a game rich in data, rich in interplay, with almost no rules and lots of data available on how to engage with it. And you can do it in a variety of languages, whether it's JavaScript in the browser, whether it's Python, whether it's Ruby, whether it's Java. There's lots of different ways to interact with this game. They have an HTTP client that has an API, um, and they are introducing a, uh, if you're familiar with the Hadios REST API, they have a whole nother area of the game that's not in space, it's on the planet. They have a PS2 game, a PS3 game, which is a first person shooter, which takes place on the planets in the game. Right. And, and there are, and it communicates back and forth. Items in, items in the, game, the, the first person shooter game, which is called Dust, can actually be bought and sold on the EVE market. And you can, in this game on the planet, you can get spaceships out in space to come and do orbital bombardment to affect the battles uh, that's happening on the planet. And this is just now being piloted up. It's just, it just was released like last November or so, October, somewhere around there. Anyway, the API between the PS3 game and EVE is all done through a REST API. It, it's a hypermedia API that's being communicated between the two. And this year, one of their big goals is to expose a lot of that hypermedia API to the game, to the general public. Of course, they have to be very careful about what they do because our community is a pretty terrible group of people. But. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been doing this? It's like one of the largest hypermedia APIs. For I, I guess my, so I used to play, I played for about two years, but it was, uh, before I had half of my kids and I gave the game up uh, for a number of years and then my my son decided he wanted to try and play he had heard about it unbeknownst to me and he decided he wanted to play and I got back into it and then he decided he didn't like it and I've been playing now for about a year and a half <laughs> it's been out since when like it's 10 years old, 10 years old. it has over half a million subscribers yeah, I remember I remember when it came up right. and if, you, if anybody's interested Come see me. We'll give you an access code that'll get us both some money. It's a mess. Yeah, that's that's all I have. I mean, we could, I could talk about this stuff for hours and hours and hours. I've shown you all the the programming stuff that I've done and all the data stuff. Uh, we can do more with it later. I don't know if we had other things planned for tonight or not.